All right, welcome everyone to the City of Santa Cruz Planning Commission meeting. Um, I'd like to call this meeting to order. Before we do anything else, I know we got some uh, late correspondence, and I just want to check, did everyone get that from staff and have a chance to take a look at it? Okay, great. Um, Tess, can we have the call to order? Commissioner Conway? Here. Dawson? Gordon? Maxwell? Here. McKelvey? Here. Paul Hamus? Here. Chair Kennedy? Here. Uh, that was the roll call, actually. Um, are there any statements of disqualification from the commissioners tonight? Seeing none, um, we'll now open the hearing for oral communications, which is the time to come on up and talk to us about anything not on tonight's agenda. Feel free. Come on up. And Tess, we'll put a two-minute timer on oral communications, please. That's okay. We'd like to hear from you. I first thank you all for your service to our city. I looked at the agenda and see that you have a 200 and some odd report on a project that's been on the uh, schedule for 12 years. So I appreciate your dedication to, um, to the city. I'm here to draw a line of sight between Mats and Britain using only the term beige to describe asbestos composite siding on an existing home in my neighborhood and debris from asbestos abatement landing in my yard. I just don't think color of an existing siding that's going to be removed from a building has any relevance, and it didn't help me in looking at the plans when I was looking at the plans. Somehow the architect was able to describe the existing roofing material as asphalt composite on the plans, and so I see a need for greater transparency in identifying asbestos composite siding or, or roofing material in plan review when this material is slated for demolition or renovation. And I think that, you know, I think some of you are old enough to sort of know what it looks like, but I think a lot of our residents don't really recognize what that siding looks like. And that exterior placement puts people at risk if it's not handled properly. If handled properly, perfectly, you know, acceptable to, um, to have that product removed from someone's house. So, um, I, you know, my letter basically recommends that that be on the plans when, when neighbors are reviewing it. So that's basically my topic. I'm going to be back in January with some other ideas. Okay. Thank uh, you. Before you go, Eric, I know nothing about this. Do you know who at the city would know more about these kind of permits? Like well, I know. I know um, environment, or maybe you could. Yeah, environmental health does get involved. In touch. We, we've been in, in touch with them on some other similar issues related oh, really? to asbestos. Okay, well, that's good to know. Um, so we, you know, we could certainly talk it through with them. Okay. It sounds like a valid concern, and uh, Eric or others are happy to connect you with the department okay. that deals with that. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah. All right. Any other oral communications? Oh, you can hear the Devo concert has started across the street. <laughs> so. Uh, is that what that is? Yeah. Glad you can hear it too. I'm not that old yet. I do remember Devo. It'll be festive at least. All right, so at this point, I'll open the public hearing for our one agenda item, the Santa Cruz Wharf uh, Master Plan. Um, we're going to have a staff presentation, but I just wanted to say a few words first. I really want to set the tone tonight to be one of listening and respect. I'm going to have a very low tolerance for shouting out from the audience and disruptions. I've understood that some of that's been going on at other commissions. Um, everyone here knows where that line is. I know you all do. I've seen some of you here a lot. So please don't cross it. This is a public forum. Let's all be civil and discuss things even when we disagree. I'm including myself in that, of course. The goal here is like to get the best work possible for Santa Cruzans, for all Santa Cruzans, not just to get what we want. So I just wanted to throw that out there and recenter us on that goal of an awesome wharf. Um, okay, and with that, I'd like to hear the staff report, please. Thanks, Chair Kennedy. Members of the commission, I'd like to introduce Dave McCormick, who is uh, the project manager for the wharf master plan. He uh, works in the economic development department. Um, also here tonight is uh, Sabrina Teller, who is our uh, legal counsel for CEQA matters, as well as Stephanie Strilo, who's our environmental consultant. And then we have Travis Beck from the Parks Department as well. 
Um, as you mentioned, we did get some correspondence which we posted on the website. One of those pieces of correspondence uh, from Jillian Greensight and John Aird raised some CEQA legal issues which we uh, at the staff felt warranted some response and we did post that response this afternoon. Um, I also have some copies uh, over there on the windowsill on the right side of the back part of the chambers if there's any members of the public that would like to read through that response. Um, Dave's going to weave some of those responses into his presentation and if there's further questions feel free to ask thanks thanks for the fast turnaround on that document uh thanks for the introduction and thanks for having me here tonight um we have a bit, little bit of a presentation here that you know take a little while but we'll get through it there's a lot of history and a lot of uh, important information that's come along uh with the recent revisions so i'm just going to go ahead and dive in um the uh we're going to start with sort of a background uh, and then what the master plan is why we need it and then kind of follow uh, that order might be a little up uh, with the public process um and then the revised eir findings and some of the public correspondence and the questions and responses that we have related to those so um the wharf today just a quick overview of, of what it is uh typically we see we estimate somewhere between two and three million visitors a year it's a top three regional visitor attraction. Um, it has roughly 25 business partners, most of whom are local businesses, um, which collectively employ over 400 people um, and about 10% of the city's restaurant workforce. Um, annually, they do about $30 million in sales uh, a year. And um, we capture about 2.9% or 2.9 million, uh, roughly 10% of that um, in revenue from rents and things for the, for the city. Um, and in 2018, the, the wharf was assessed for insurance purposes at roughly uh, $119.3 million. So you can see the value, it's a very valuable uh, historic resource. Um, we're here tonight uh, to discuss or to engage the commission in, in their mandate of um, consulting council on land use matters, uh, particularly master plans and future planning efforts in the city. Um, Previously, the, the Planning Commission has heard uh, uh, updates and uh, actually hearings on the Wharf Master Plan three times in the past. Um, in 2014, they provided, they received an update on progress and provided feedback to staff. And in 2016, the, uh, the Planning Commission recommended adoption of the plan, um, or unanimously recommended adoption of the plan and a mitigated neg deck for uh, the initial study. Uh, subsequent to that, uh, council directed staff to prepare a full EIR, and so back in 2020, when the EIR was considered again uh, by the Planning Commission, uh, the Commission voted to recommend approval uh, subject to some minor changes. Um, the, uh, the Wharf Master Plan was approved by council in November of 2020, um, but during the sequel appeal period, a group known as uh, Don't Morph the Wharf, some of whom are in the audience tonight, um, filed a CEQA appeal and a subsequent lawsuit um, charging that the, the city had not uh, complied with CEQA requirements for a number of, of causes, including aesthetics and uh, historical impacts, recreational analysis, uh, land use, and others. Um, in, in the end, the court ruled on relatively narrow grounds uh, specific to a lack of evidence and, a, and insufficient analysis of recreational impacts and related land use policies as well as uh, uh, insufficient support for a rationale uh, for rejection of alternative two, which was uh, identified in the EIR as the environmentally superior alternative. And uh, the result of those uh, findings was that we had to rescind, rescind approvals of the EIR and the Wharf Master Plan. Uh, we were not allowed to have a, a partially complete EIR, so although only limited parts of it were found inadequate, uh, the entire thing had to be rescinded and the master plan with it. Um, we have, uh, apart from these elements here, nothing else has changed in the IR analysis. And so it's uh, considered to be established set of law uh, because there were no impacts that hadn't been, you know, no deficiencies in the, the court's analysis or upheld in the court's analysis. Um, the Santa Cruz Wharf Master Plan Report uh, is just the cover of it. Really, it's about increasing the resilience of the wharf and balancing the economic, social, and environmental needs uh, of the wharf as it relates to our community. And that includes, you know, uh, it, when we look back at uh, the pandemic, uh, economic um, resilience has become an increasingly important uh, consideration. Although, of course, the, the you know, the environmental um, concerns are, are paramount. Uh, to get to the, the plan as we have it today, there's no fewer than four council meetings, nine commission hearings. I think there's actually the ninth one tonight. 
um, eight focus group hearings with different groups uh, representing specific constituencies, uh, numerous stakeholder meetings, interagency meetings, thousands of mailers, uh, 100th anniversary showcase during the centennial celebration, as well as a milestone meeting, and uh, at least 12 news articles during its creation and more since then. Uh, just a, a quick glimpse of some of the stakeholders who were involved in drafting this plan. We include the, the bulk of wharf tenants, uh, beach area businesses, marketing and tourism agencies, community groups, civic organizations, uh, including Santa Cruz Neighbors, the Outrigger Club, Friends of Parks and Rec, Rotary, lots of them shown there, as well as marine and interagency and research partners like uh, the Surfrider Foundation, uh, California State Parks, NOAA, Army Corps, all of these organizations had a role in, uh, in promoting or, or in developing and supporting the plan uh, throughout its creation. Uh, what is the Wharf Master then? Again, it's the result of uh, extensive public engagement and engineering uh, and, and analysis. Uh, it's a framework, not a prescription for what happens next, but it provides us the outside guidelines and the rules. It's a long-term plan for the Wharf. Uh, and it's most importantly a financing tool that's required for us to, to attract grant funds from state and federal agencies. Um, and ultimately it'll expand public access by about two and a half acres. Uh, most of where the wharf would expand is almost entirely uh, recreational and public access improvements. What it won't do, it's not immediately gonna get anything built tomorrow. Uh, there'll still be years of additional hearings and, and design and fundraising. Um, it won't allow ocean liners uh, to park at the wharf. It won't remove sea lion viewing holes. Those are now committed to, to being retained uh, or relocated. Uh, it won't mandate tall buildings. It'll cap them at 40 feet uh, for the three public buildings and 35 feet for the commercial. And it won't significantly impact bird and marine life. Um, there are some impacts that are mitigated during construction, but beyond that, there were no impacts identified. It won't close the door on future engagement, and it won't reduce fishing or sightseeing opportunities. It will expand them. Uh, so what's new? Uh, quickly, it's the, there will be an upgrade to lifeguard, lifeguard station. There's a new gateway signage and entrance uh, to help facilitate traffic and uh, parking movements uh, and, and brand the wharf a little bit. Uh, there'll be a new eastern promenade. It's a multimodal and emergency access pathway along the east side uh, together with fishing. And small boat landings uh, will consolidate existing boat launches and landings. Uh, together with a new south landing for larger vessels like uh, whale watches and fishing charters and research vessels, uh, up to 200 tons of displacement. Um, and at the end, we'll have an uh, expanded viewing opportunities with uh, an overlook uh, with new ledgers that are built for support, as well as a step-down overlook or terraced overlook, as it's referred to in the plan, uh, that creates sort of an amphitheater uh, down near the water on the other side, or a, a couple feet below deck anyway. Um, and then the landmark building, which is intended to replicate uh, or, or mimic the original warehouse building that once stood at the end of the wharf and could be provided for a number of uh, public or quasi-public uses. Uh, an extension on the west side uh, to really create that, that uh, one-mile circuit and to reinforce, really reinforce the wharf as a whole. Uh, these improvements, when you look at them, are really about um, kind of wrapping the breadth of the wharf in a, a protective layer of new infrastructure. Um, and uh, the new events pavilion uh, would put a, a like like a canopy type uh, enclosure over the existing stage. It would replace that with an all season venue that could help attract visitation throughout the year and provide more functionality for the wharf uh, for events and social gatherings. Uh, and then finally along the western side, uh, there'll be a, a recessed or a slightly uh, below deck, about eight feet below deck um, protective walkway. Uh, that would be open seasonally and would provide a, a defensive barrier against marine debris, uh, ship impacts, and uh, waves. It would help dissipate wave energy, uh, as we'll discuss. And then a welcome center um, is envisioned down where the, the, the current boat rental building is uh, to help invite people and sort of orient them. That facility, as we'll talk in a minute, uh, has some other additional exciting opportunities. Um, so mainly, the Wharf Master Plan is about expanding public access. Uh, that's primarily achieved through the East Promenade and the West Walkway. Um, as you can see there on the west side, there's that, that lowered walkway that would, is intended to avoid impacts to views from restaurants while providing new views uh, beneath the deck as well as recreational you know, fishing opportunities and walking and sightseeing. Uh, and it, there's a, a swim float that goes with it. And then the east promenade is that, uh, that multiple use, multimodal um, promenade uh, with the dedicated fishing areas along the side and the capacity to support uh, emergency vehicles uh, so they don't get mired in the traffic. 
Um, the East Promenade would help reduce uh, conflicts between pedestrians and uh, fishermen, uh, particularly the tailgate fishing as you see it there, uh, where oftentimes it's not possible to achieve ADA access through the, that sort of a gathering. Uh, and then along the west side, you can see that open water swim float uh, that would drop down uh, along the west side as it enters into the west uh, walkway. Um, these, these improvements, again, they create resilience opportunities. Uh, they, they provide that emergency access on the east promenade. The new boat landings provide evacuation and supply points. Uh, and the west walkway uh, helps protect vulnerable piles beneath the buildings where they cannot be repaired uh, while buildings stand. Um, and, um, and they predict that with that marine barrier as well as wave dissipation. Uh, the, uh, the West Walkway in particular is envisioned to be a, a quasi-permeable uh, membrane or, or surfacing uh, that would help, again, dissipate wave force as it comes through, as well as um, you know, protecting and trying to catch the, the logs and things that frequently bang into the bottom of the wharf. Um, that protection, just another slide showing it. Uh, the concept there is essentially a wave force attenuation. Um, it, as we look at climate adaptation globally, there's a number of strategies. This is one that's a floating wave attenuator. Uh, the, the one proposed here is above water level, and it would catch the waves as they hit a certain peak vo velocity uh, and size. Um, and then there's the, the you know, examples of the types of debris that get stuck under the wharf and damage pilings and infrastructure, as well as what uh, the wharf crew has to do to get them out. Um, the, a quick visual of what that looks like. Uh, the bottom image shows uh, the artist rendering from the EIR. There were no visual or aesthetic impacts uh, identified in the AR, and the court did not um, agree with the, the don't morph the wharf's contention that there were. Um, so the, the uh, but for you know discussion purposes, you can see the rendering is provided here. Uh, I would note a couple things. Uh, the first is that the the railings that are proposed that are shown in the image. Are, are utilizing a white paint and a similar treatment as the, the deck railings existing. That's for legibility of the image. It helps you to see where it actually is. Uh, in the wharf master plan, minimalist railings uh, with like, um, like cable and, and mesh are proposed to minimize the visual impact. Um, but also coloring and materials could change uh, at the design stage. This is just a programmatic placeholder. Um, but up top, uh, the Don't Worth the Wharf uh, and some of the, the, the public correspondence has suggested that the, the west walkway would bisect uh, the views along the, that length of the wharf. And as you can see, existing landings and service points uh, and ledgers down below the wharf already do that in many cases. Um, so it's just a, another perspective on it. Um, and then the last thing is that as you move along away from the viewer, the alignment of the, the pilings tends to create a solid image, uh, which sort of limits the, the effect of visibility and a disruption of that transparency. Uh, moving on, the accessible landings. Um, the new landings would be universally accessible, providing what doesn't exist today, of accessible water access to, um, from the wharf, uh, which has a great opportunity to expand uh, equitable access to, to water sports and boating um, that we're really excited about. Uh, the top image on the left is that small boat landing. It would consolidate the boat rentals and the kayak uses into one central facility, uh, together with wharf operations um, and, and potentially fireboat um, mooring or a temporary fireboat mooring. Uh, and then on the south side, uh, the, the south landing there is for larger vessels, um, which could potentially see the, the return of fish landings. It could see the return of you know tour tour boats and and fishing charters, whale well, watches, all of that kind of stuff from the wharf. Uh, as well as research vessels. And then that west side swim float that I mentioned earlier, uh, which provides water sport access and swimming access from the west side of the wharf where we don't currently have it. Um, examples of the types of vessels that could uh, moor at the, or, or you know, temporarily dock at the uh, south landing. The top one there is uh, on the left, the Infinity Expedition shows what a 200 ton, 120 foot uh, vessel would typically look like or could typically look like. Um, that is the design capacity of that landing. Um, it's not intended to serve larger vessels than that, um, but different alignments uh, and massing gives you different types of ships. Uh, so you can see the Rachel Carson, one of Mimbari's fleet. You can see the dredge from the harbor. Uh, you can see the, you know, the Coast Guard vessel that's shown there. Um, the master plan includes three new cultural buildings, the so Welcome Center, the Pavilion, and the Landmark Building. Um, Again, the, the artist rendering there shows a maximum of 45 feet, uh, which is no longer 
So no longer included in the plan, it's now down to a, a maximum of 40. Um, but that is, uh, is really setting the outside parameters for this building. Uh, the intent of it, though, is to, to recreate or, or reimagine the, the historic uh, warehouse building that was once there. Uh, the plan calls for limited new commercial, uh, primarily through second story additions and outside dining upstairs or, or just second story uses. Uh, there is the opportunity for some infill around the, the pavilion structure. Uh, and in a couple other locations where you could potentially consolidate some of the, the um, some of the public space or some some other elements into like pocket retail, um, so it anticipates about four thousand square feet of infill and um, up to thirty percent uh, gain through the second story additions. Notable within this uh, is the idea of of liner uses. You can see little like orange boxes in the bottom right image. Uh, that's looking at activating blank storefronts by having smaller, discrete sort of commercial and, and activity uses uh, along the, the frontage. Uh, the lifeguard upgrade is envisioned to be one or two stories. It would continue to have the, uh, a view tower. Uh, it would also provide storage and equipment for, uh, for marine rescue and junior guards and potentially uh, associated mooring for their rescue or fire boat vessels. Uh, the plan also envisions a, a new entrance gateway. Um, in previous iterations of the plan, council, um, the, the sort of image at the bottom left uh, was uh, the, the signage that's shown there was determined really to, as a placeholder and that there will be a public process for developing a really iconic Santa Cruz sign. Uh, and so uh, the image here provides some inspirational imagery to that end. Uh, parking operations, uh, the plan envisions restriping the existing parking uh, to gain about uh, 10 to 15 percent or about 40 to 60 spaces. Uh, the entrance gates will be lo relocated down on the wharf a bit farther uh, to re reduce traffic impacts into the roundabout um, and you know hopefully to create efficiency through um, sort of a hybrid staff boot and pay station or staff booth and pay station option. Um, other operational improvements, the plan envisions a pneumatic trash collection to reduce garbage truck use, remove trash enclosures, and then um, together with in interpretive materials and, and other emergency responses, we look at communications and internet upgrades, uh, as well as utility resilience and things like that. I should break in. Uh, in 2016, we learned that that system would not harm seagulls, so go on. That's good to know. <laughs> yeah. All right. At the, um, the, uh, Wharf master plan includes new design standards uh, specific to the you know, buildings and, and new construction out there uh, and modifications of the existing. Um, in the latest revisions to the plan, we've gone a little bit farther. We're recommending, um, in order to sort of not force height, uh, we've made some modifications uh, within the design parameters. So where we still have that cap of 35 and 40 feet for the buildings, what we've done is we've reduced the ground floor height to a minimum of 12 from 15 feet uh, so that the buildings don't automatically have to be taller. Um, when you go out there, you see you know 10 to 12 foot uh, ceilings are fairly common, but m much above that isn't really consistent with what's out there. Uh, so we, we kind of are suggesting to lower that. Uh, we've also reduced the uh, the uh, original proposal for the glazed canopy, uh, the glazed storefront beneath the canopy, which I think was previously 12 feet with the 15 foot minimum floor height, and we reduced it to eight so that there can be some variation in the storefronts and window sizes. So again, we're not just floor to ceiling windows. Um, so those are the major ones. We also uh, eliminated a requirement that the signs had to be horizontal. Um, that was the other major change in, in the, the design thing. The parameter, the size of the signs is still preserved as it was in the last version, um, but just suggesting that there, there could be a, you know, vertical signage that fits within the buildings. All right. Um, and then, so really, why, why do we need the master plan? It was called for in the Beach South of Laurel plan, and um, the, uh, the Coastal Commission and the, the powers that be that created that plan identified that the, the existing wharf plan from 1980 was well outdated and no longer reflected community goals or uh, you know, adequate analysis. Um, it, it's important to codify the various roles served by the wharf and to provide the guidance um, for future decisions in, in fundraising. Uh, just a quick image of the, the 1980 beach area plan. Uh, this is the, the wharf design framework that was adopted and, and what the sort of existing plan for the wharf is. Uh, you can see the, um, as much as it's outdated, I would say, um, you can see the sort of inspiration from the Pacific Garden Mall with the hexagonal structures. You see the dog leg that was added to, to enhance mooring. Uh, 
Um, but this did lead to some significant improvements. The, the commons area with the stages was built through this plan. Uh, a lot of the newer buildings like Rolita's and Marini's and the, the Surf Life, uh, the shops and stuff, those that the Agora, all of that was constructed with this plan. Uh, but as you can see, the master plan doesn't always lead to everything envisioned. Is that the roundabout on the left there? Yep, yep, the roundabout's all the way on the left there. Thanks. So, you know, certain elements came to be, but the, the, the overall vision of, the, of what was created is different than what was planned. So just a minder. But really, uh, the master plan is about the greater need. Uh, the wharf is a historic structure of over 100 years old. Um, try as they might, the wharf crew can't keep up with the, the pace of degradation um, in its environment. Uh, so in 2014, when the 2013-14, uh, when the engineering report was prepared, uh, they identified an infrastructure backlog of 11 and a half million or so of, of required infrastructure investments. If you just did an inflation adjustment, it's probably closer to 14 million, but recent uh, bid results and things suggest that it's quite a bit higher to do the repairs. Um, but it, it's built upon unsustainable financials and a city budget crisis, uh, along with businesses that can no longer you know, shoulder increasing um, rents uh, in line with, without redu increasing costs beyond you know, palatable levels for many Santa Cruzans. Um, so the, the lesson is that outside funding is needed. And so again, this is just a summary of the infrastructure backlog as it's found in the engineering report. Um, the, the, the financials are such that uh, over the past eight years or so, we've seen an increasing decline in the, the balance uh, where uh, revenues aren't really keeping pace with uh, the cost of operating the wharf. Um, the purple line there shows the overall expenses, the, um, the maintenance and operations as a portion of that is shown in orange, and the, the green is the revenues. So you can see that we're, we're subsidizing about a million and a half um, this past year, and it's, it's been in that ballpark for a number of years. Uh, the few years where we did, oh, that orange is supposed to line up with the 600,000 and the 11,000. But the, the few years where we did sort of balance out ahead, uh, we had supplemental insurance revenues from, I think, storm damage or the tsunami, something like that. Um, um, and when we look back at the, the capital expenditure history for the wharf, uh, only about 4.2 million over the past roughly 20 years has really been invested as a capital project in the wharf. Um, the bulk of the 8 million shown here is uh, tied to the wharf beach intersection and the wharf master plan itself, uh, neither of which really is an investment in the wharf. Um, so returning back to that, that CEQA challenge, um, you know, the, the ruling was that we had to evaluate uh, the recreation, the land use policies, uh, and support our, our rationale for rejection of alternative two. So we're gonna go ahead and just dive right into that. Um, first and foremost, our recreational analysis is based on, uh, we evaluated the city's own definitions of recreation and recreation facilities, and found that they uh, weren't, weren't as comprehensive as we felt this, this facility needed. Uh, the wharf serves a broad variety of, of recreational uh, uses. And so we looked at state law and we found the most expansive def definition in state law. And then we based our recreational analysis on that. And that includes everything from entertainment and cultural, uh, as well as uh, mental and physical development, um, recre traditional recreational activities, culture and art, all of that. Uh, so within that framework, we analyzed uh, the improvements in the master plan as related to these uh, land use policy documents uh, that you can see them all there and found that, they, that the master plan and its improvements are consistent and would not conflict with recreational policies. Uh, specifically, the improvements proposed would protect and enhance public access and coastal recreation. They would not intrude on beaches or bluffs. They would, not expand, or they would expand economic and educational opportunities, um, provide free multimodal access or expand it, uh, and maintain and expand fishing access. Um, Within the, the recreational analysis, uh, these are all the different various different topics uh, that were studied. Uh, I can try and breeze through those. There's a lot of them. Um, first, and oh, first and foremost, uh, the walking and biking. As you can see, the, the circuits would expand. You'd have a, a new one-mile circuit around the outside of the wharf. You'd have multiple paths of travel that could be commercial or purely recreational, um, and utilizing the east promenade, the end of wharf widening, the west side walkway. Ultimately, they would, uh, the improvements would reduce use conflicts and provide ADA access. They'd separate bicycles and pedestrians from vehicle travel. Uh, they'd improve emergency access, and there would be a, a roughly 11% increase in the wharf's perimeter. Um, again, they're just showing that image again of what those look like. 
um, nature viewing, the terraced overlook, the, the various walkways, um, and even some of the buildings have the potential to provide new viewpoints. Um, there would be um, new ADA access to the water and new experiences below deck, uh, a little closer to animals and things. And with the permeable surfacing on that east west walkway, you'd have the, a new experience of sort of walking over the water and viewing under the deck. And then just sort of seeing what that uh, you know view would look like. You can see the terraced overlook up on the top right and the artist rendering there. Um, as part of that analysis, uh, as far as uh, wildlife viewing and things, we looked at the, the feasibility of the sea lion viewing holes. Uh, one of the elements that the, the court ruled against the city on uh, was that the original plan uh, didn't really address what was going to happen to the, the viewing holes. The landmark building was shown in the exhibits on top of them, um, but there was no discussion of what happened uh, or what would be done with them. Uh, during the, the previous review process in 2020, we heard the community's feedback and the council committed to a policy that would require it to uh, maintain or, um, or preserve or, or relocate those sea lion viewing holes. Uh, but the court felt that because the exhibit showed a building in that place, um, to not address how they'd be preserved in a, in a rational way uh, was a deferral of, of potential impacts. So we went back and we looked at, okay, how could you go about uh, preserving or relocating the, the sea lion viewing holes? Uh, and this exhibit was provided uh, to show that, you know, depending upon how you move the building and what sacrifices you might make there, or how you, you choose to move the sea lion viewing holes, there are feasible options. Uh, these are not by any means the only feasible options, but they're just a, a few examples of how it could be done. Uh, the bottom image in particular also looks at, could you expand sea lion viewing along the breadth of the wharf? Could you create new opportunities at other portions of the plan uh, to provide a similar experience as exists today at the end of the wharf? Uh, and it shows that it, it, it could be done in a number of strategies, including reclaiming parking, working it into existing spaces, providing below deck viewing with some of the landings and stuff. So there, there's a number of strategies identified in the exhibit uh, and in the discussion of the, the revised uh, EIR. Uh, recreational fishing. Um, the, the master plan takes a, a really innovative look at, at fishing. It examines it um, through GIS and, and mapping and distancing, but it also looks at it in, as a variety of zones. So there's different types of fishing experiences that exist in different waters around the wharf, uh, from the, the sort of shore, crash, the wave crash zone, all the way out to the open water and even in between pilings and stuff. There's different experiences and different catches. Uh, as well as the tailgate fishing. Uh, so it examines it in those ways, uh, breaks it down, but overall what it shows is that there's a 21% increase in allowable fishing uh, with what seems like the most you know, um, obvious uh, safe zones and restricted areas, um, but that, you know, as well as uh, an expansion in the, the reef style fishing. So the west walkway provides new opportunities below deck to try and get in those challenging spots beneath the piles. Um, however, tailgate fishing would be produced significantly. Um, the, the provision of the, the dedicated uh, fishing areas along the east promenade um, and the, the provision of additional you know, walking space there uh, makes it so that the tailgate fishing isn't exactly on the edge of the wharf. Uh, it's on the side of the, the east promenade and they have to walk across or uh, if they have mobility issues, they'd have to go from a handicap space to a ramp, uh, which presumably would be close by. Um, Overall, tailgate fishing could still be preserved in a number of locations, um, primarily in the east parking lot, but also past Tegnaros and over by uh, before the um, the uh, the lifeguard station. So there'd still be fishing occurring in each of the zones that it currently exists, um, and it would be about 100 to or 80 to 100 spaces that we'd anticipate available for uh, tailgate fishing, and that's over uh, that's compared to about 440 parking spaces as a whole on the wharf. Um, the intent, though, is to dedicate those seating areas to reduce the conflicts uh, between fishing and multi uses, and there would also be expanded boating and west side fishing. Um, this exhibit here that was prepared in the recirculated partial draft EIR uh, compares various fishing options. Um, it shows the different zones uh, by color and, and um, dash marks. The contrast isn't as great as I'd like, but it's there. Um, and in the bottom left corner, you can see the, the net increase uh, or change um, in the, the various types of uh, fishing and access. Um, so overall, fishing would expand, 
the exhibit shows us where we anticipate it. As the boat landings uh, get further designed, there may be opportunities to increase fishing further, um, but this is based on the, you know, the designs that exist in the program level. Boating and open water sports. All of the landings, including the open water swim sport, uh, provide new universal access uh, to the water. Uh, they create new launch and landing opportunities that don't exist, um, f uh, particularly like along uh, with the west, on the, along the west side on Cowell. Uh, there would be a new opportunity with that swim float to to get out there and, and launch your surfboard for someone who might have mob mobility issues, um, and, and just visitors. Um, there's also a new opportunity for day boat tours from the south landing and, and the small boat landing. And um, the gateway star, the welcome center, could potentially include warming and shower facilities for swimmers and activities. Um, so just a quick image of what that looks like today and, and where it would be going, some of the activities. Uh, the, uh, the plan calls for increased opportunities for education and science. Um, with the new public buildings, it calls for a wharf interpretive plan that would weave together the various narratives around the wharf, from environment to science to history, uh, and others that would be developed in the process uh, based on community feedback. Um, and then the South Landing can support those research vessels uh, that come and go. And uh, there's you know expanded opportunity for creating partnerships with regional partners. Um, again, the potential impacts are new facilities, new opportunities for all of these things. Um, and then cultural, the new public buildings, particularly the, the events pavilion, uh, creates new opportunities for events and um, you know, cultural activities and entertainment. Um, circulation improvements create the, the capacity to manage that, and the communication infrastructure enriches it and provides new economic opportunities as a result. Um, again, the, the, the key here is, is enhancing the year-round capacity of the wharf. That's the, the real important thing. But the interpretive plan also provides opportunities for art and things like that. Shopping and dining, uh, it's sort of a non-traditional recreational activity or leisure activity, um, but it's nonetheless part of the reason a lot of people go out there. Um, they would also have the opportunity to expand primarily through those second floor uses, but also in some of the liner uses and infill um, and, and, and pop-ups and things. Some examples of what second floor uses might look like. Uh, and then the sort of pop-up. So there's, uh, as wharf development happens and as opportunity sites are, and underutilized areas are identified, there could be opportunities for you know, pop-ups and, and uh, activations to, to create new, op new events and, and uh, experiences for people on the wharf. Those sort of things are temporary by nature, but they're intended to allow the, the wharf to continue to adapt to its, its user base. Um, all right, moving along, uh, the, uh, what, the uh, uh, another element that the court wanted us to, to dwell on a bit more and, and investigate and, and increase or improve our findings is the, the alternatives analysis. So as you know, under CEQA, uh, we're required to identify and study alternative projects. Um, in this case, three, uh, three were studied. There was the no project requirement, and then there was the alternative one, which would have removed the landmark building and reduced the width of the East Promenade. And then there was the alternative two, uh, which would have removed the uh, west walkway uh, and reduced building heights to 40 feet. Um, just going back to this, uh, when you evaluate the alternatives, uh, the, the city and its discretionary bodies have to evaluate how effectively the plan would still achieve the project objectives in light of the changes proposed in the alternative. So in this particular instance, the highlighted uh, objectives are ones that seem to staff to be most closely aligned with removal of the west walkway uh, as you know and through the public comment that this is the the contention and and with the court uh ruling uh, that's the the city opted to reject that uh, environmentally superior alternative for a number of reasons uh but didn't adequately support that with evidence uh and discussion of why um so um as we see it the removal of the west walkway uh, would entail potential impacts uh, such that it wouldn't provide additional lateral stability or the defensive barrier discussed earlier. Uh, it, would be, it would result in the loss of a new pedestrian public access and swimming access. It would reduce uh, fishing opportunities, um, again, the, no water access, and there would be no wildlife viewing or sightseeing from that side of the wharf, as well as um, the elimination of potential emergency response access. So fire wouldn't be able to access the water from that side. They wouldn't be able to uh, fight fires uh, below deck or along the west side of the buildings, uh, which uh, is often the upwind side of the buildings. 
Um, as I said, the court ruling did not, the, the, the city did not adequately support the rationale. Um, we've gone and reinforced the findings with more evidence based on the engineer's uh, findings in the engineering report and their extensive experience with similar facilities. Uh, the project engineers at Monfit and Nickel do wharves and piers and marine infrastructure all the way around the world, including military facilities and are among the best in the field. Um, proposed findings include additional discussion of these things, and no additional historic or aesthetic analysis uh, was needed or required by the court, nor has any been provided uh, that justify uh, potential impacts. And there's again just a, a glimpse of that defensive function. Uh, this is a, a slide that was shared with the Historic Preservation Commission showing uh, the damage survey that was done after the storms in 1983, 82-83. Uh, uh, and one of the things notable is, you know, here at this point, they're showing pilings that were destroyed in a small series of storms. Uh, all of those little dots throughout the war for those. Uh, but notably, underneath the buildings, pile missing can't be replaced, should be okay. Uh, that, that site there with the three was the Miramar building. It survived uh, another several decades through innovative uh, strategies like uh, A-frames and things. Uh, but had it been a, a load-bearing pile, that were, had these been load-bearing piles that were lost, um, that, that would not have been a, a viable option, uh, and a building could be destabilized in a matter of minutes. So this is where uh, the West Walkway is intended to, to provide that defensive barrier and, and eliminate these sort of uh, things. Uh, that site has now been uh, restored and fixed up, however. And so um, in the public correspondence that you received uh, from Don't Morph the Wharf, uh, I've tried to sort of consolidate responses. Again. Yeah. Was the Miramar knocked down because of that? Uh, it began with that. Like a lot of things. It was a number of things. There was a roof collapse uh, that happened. The building was in deteriorated state, but the, underneath it, there was no other option to reuse it because the conditions were so bad. Is, is my understanding. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. So in their, their statement, uh, I've tried to summarize quickly. There's a lot there. Um, in the first statement, the they cite the Historic Preservation Commission uh, re recommendation to council that said council should consider removal of the West Side Walkway based on um, their, uh, I don't know what the allegation, I guess, or suggestion of historical visual impacts that weren't identified in the, the or weren't consistent with uh, historical analysis in the AR. Um, they also brought up. Um, unstudied bird impacts from the human use of the West Side Walkway. And they, they suggested that was the case. And they cited the court ruling uh, on a lack of evidence supporting the rejection of alternative two. Uh, in response, the city in their, their you know, response that's been published here, uh, we state that the HPCA recommendation is, as well as in the staff report actually, uh, the recommendation is not supported by evidence in the record or the EIR analysis. Uh, revisions were not required for the entire EIR, only those certain sections, and that the city can circulate only revisions and focus comments on those revisions uh, during the recirculation process of an EIR. Um, and then no historic or aesthetic impacts have been identified. The court dismissed uh, complaints to that effect uh, in its ruling, and none have, no new ones have yet been identified. Uh, the court ruled only on grounds of insufficient evidence, it did not and cannot decide how the city exercises its discretion. It did not make statements uh, against the plan itself, um, but merely on the lack of evidence within the EIR. Um, in the uh, findings of fact, the Don't Morph the Wharf suggests that the, that the findings of fact were not made available to the Parks and Rec Commission or the HPC. Uh, findings, uh, it says that the findings, modifications that have been included are just restating the inadequacies the court identified. Uh, they suggest that fire access, rather than from the west walkway, could be provided uh, via the existing maintenance walkway. Uh, so that safety can be improved um, along the west side by restricting mooring within 200 feet of the west side of the wharf. And it, comp it felt that uh, any comparison with Sea Cliff and Capitola Wharf uh, was baseless uh, and just evidences, you know, lesser designed wharfs uh, as far as their, their risk and not not comparable to the wharf, I guess, is sort of what it is. And then they alluded to as yet unidentified alternatives to the West Walkway that pr protect, uh, provide the same or similar protection functions. The city's response is that draft findings and resolutions were posted for each prior hearing. Findings include extensive additional discussion of engineering recommendations and safety considerations, and they connect with policy goals depicting the need for the walkway. Comments provide no objection, uh, or, or the commenters provide 
no objective evidence to the contrary to these statements. Uh, existing maintenance walkway does not provide appropriate separation. Uh, you can imagine that it's on a five foot walkway, it would be difficult to fight a fire on a building next to you. Um, so the, the west side walkway provides that separation as well as below deck access points. Uh, the master plan includes policy language, uh, already uh, it already includes policy language that would limit mooring along the west side of the wharf. So we, we we're in agreement on that. And then the, uh, the Seacliff Pier and Capitola Pier were merely stated as examples of the types of processes that are at play in coastal engineering. Uh, they uh, are examples of where overtopping can collapse a marine structure. Uh, and they are example of where the, the additional decking on the outside of the Capitola Pier uh, is, uh, provides a dissipation function, even at its own cost. Uh, so as we look at sort of the, the images here, and we can, there's a video if you want to see it, um, but this image of the wharf, uh, the Capitola Wharf, you can see how the decking took damage, but the waves uh, splashed through and were dissipated as, uh, in, as opposed to damaging the building that might have been directly on the edge of the wharf, uh, such as the case on the west side of our wharf. Um, the video that's available online showing the overtopping of the Seacliff Pier uh, gives you an idea of how the mass of the wave on top of it, together with the velocity and the sort of suction effect, uh, can quickly overwhelm and, and destroy uh, marine structures. And so this is sort of the, the perspective that I received from our engineering uh, consultant after the last hearing. Um, errors of fact in the resolution. The city statement that the engineering report states the, the west walkway is essential is inaccurate. Uh, they suggest that other reinforcement options, um, including additional west side pilings, could achieve the same goals. Uh, Functionally, the, <laughs> the additional pilings could potentially, as they propose, could potentially um, provide an additional layer um, similar to the west walkway, but you wouldn't get as many of them and you wouldn't get the sort of wave dissip dissipation function of the platform uh, in that case. Uh, but, you know, additional pilings always uh, provide some level of additional help. Um, the city's claim that a, a master planning error needed for grant funding is inaccurate. They cite that a recent grant that was received for the Miramar site as evidence, uh, and they insist that the court ruled that the entire EIR was, should be rescinded and that a partial recirculation does not comply with that court ruling. Uh, so our response is that the city disagrees uh, with the assertion about engineering and that there are viable alternatives. Um, it's not you know, the finding of uh, our engineers. Uh, and it's uh, state and federal law do require environmental review uh, before awarding funding. Uh, there's sections cited in the staff report from CEQA, if I recall. Um, and the Miramar site, oops, typo. Uh, the Miramar site uh, ha received an emergency permit from the Coastal Commission uh, following the, the roof collapse uh, for the demolition and the infrastructure work to repair it. And the the sort of Federal permits fell under maintenance uh, that was already permitted for that site or, or for the wharf. Uh, the court ruling was narrow in scope and it exceeded requirements for uh, the city, receded requirements for our responses. So we didn't need to reopen the entire plan because it was a narrow ruling based on limited aspects of the IR. So we focused on those. And when we received comments back um, on topics that were already answered in other sections of the IR or where we had already responded to, uh, we provided citations to responders to find those answers. So rather than respond to every question, we responded with where they could find the answer that was already provided, uh, which exceeds the, the state mandate for responses on EIRs. And then, um, again, CEQA allows us to limit the circulation or recirculation of uh, an EIR to its revised components. Um, and, right, and then there are comments on the sea lion viewing holes, uh, that the city did not respond to the court ruling to show mitigation for sea lion viewing holes. Uh, they, they didn't uh, agree with the, the statement in the existing policy in the master plan that uh, to the greatest extent feasible. Uh, they, they contend that it's a, a vague metric um, and would like something more objective to ensure that the city complies with uh, preservation and, and or relocation of those holes. Um, and so again, uh, the city's response is that the plan commits to preservation and relocation of the holes, so there is no impact because they will be included in any future project that might impact them. Um, the modifications to the programmatic landmark building, among other features, are shown in that figure, um, and they create feasible options, or they depict feasible options um, for how the, the holes could be retained. Um, and then any proposal that would impact and not preserve or relocate the holes would be inconsistent with the master plan and EIR, 
triggering additional analysis. Um, no evidence is shown or has been provided showing that these options are not feasible. And do I have another? Let me see. So again, there's the exhibit we're talking about. We looked at that. And then uh, the fishing. So the loss of 1,700 linear fishing. Can go back to oh. see just for a second sure. before we go one back. Okay. So any, uh, let me just read that one again. Any proposal that impact and not preserve really good those will be in, and could trigger a whole new EIR cycle. So we're providing that diagram and that like closes that risk down. Yeah, it's saying that so we, there's opportunities here. You know, if, if if you don't, if you move past those and you don't just, take the action. I appreciate your pace, but I, I just yeah. took me a minute to think that. Yeah, no. thank you. Sure. Um, so again, the fishing, uh, the loss of 1,700 feet of tailgate fishing, uh, I'm not sure if it's explicit, but I think the suggestion is that it's an impact. Um, they didn't feel that the, they felt that issues like the short walk from parking to the, the new fishing areas and then potential interference with bikes and pedestrians on the promenade are issues that are unresolved. Um, then, then the, uh, that the, they suggest that the city continues to propose uh, deferred impacts um, by suggesting that uh, future policies might then modify fishing in, in various locations. And then that some areas proposed for fishing are unsafe, uh, but they don't go so far as to suggest what areas those are. Um, the city's response is that overall fishing will be expanded and not reduced. ADA and access improvements are already required and they will be improved uh, through the improvements. Uh, reduced, reducing um, those improvements will reduce the existing bike and ped conflicts um, with tailgate fishing, and that there is no legal mandate to preserve specific modes of fishing, just generally fishing and fishing access. Um, tailgate fishing will still be allowed in other locations, once again, 80 to 100 spaces or so. Um, and then again, this exhibit shows where we anticipate that it would be feasible, where it is today, um, and you know. Again, as the projects move forward, that, that'll be refined. Um, and then just a quick glimpse again, outreach to date. Uh, there's all of that. Uh, we've additionally done some grant seeking outreach uh, since it was uh, approved in the past, uh, or it was improved in 2020. Um, however, all that's kind of on hold at the moment. Um, and there will be many opportunities for future engagement. Um, so as projects, uh, proposals become plans, or sorry, as plant proposals become projects, uh, there'll be opportunities for public engagement then. There'll be no shortage of commission and council hearings to get those to a, a shovel-ready site. Um, a lot of state and federal permitting uh, requires outreach, as do grants these days. Uh, it's becoming uh, very much the standard among new grant programs to require public outreach. Um, and then, of course, design refinements and the interpretive plan provides a really exciting um, cross-community opportunity for engagement. So with that, I will adjourn my lengthy presentation and... Let you. Hand it going. That was a great summary of a lot of stuff. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. All right. So uh, next, we'll move to commission questions for staff, and then I'll open the public hearing for public comment after that. Any, any questions for staff? And let's all just take a deep breath. This is going to take a while to get through, so feel free to relax and ask your questions. Yeah. Talk into your mic. I've been reminded. <clears throat> Mike. Thank you for the report. Um, yeah, that was a lot of information. Nice job. Um, really quickly, I one thing in the staff report, and I am I'm comfortable with the language around the sea lion viewing holes. My memory was that it said um, you know to retain or to relocate to an area with greater or enhanced viewing. I think was the the language. Something to that effect. Something to that effect. It gave me the impression that, you know, if these are going to be moved, it's going to be moved to a better spot. So I'm just curious on what the metric would be. Like, I'm, I'm comfortable with that language. I'm, I, this is just for my own curiosity. Yeah, I, be I believe the, the language also included a public engagement uh, process in that. And so it would be subject to the results of that public engagement. So, great. Thanks. Yeah. Fishing access seems to be <clears throat> primary. Uh, concern here. I'm, I'm curious. It's not that fishing access isn't being expanded overall, correct? We're getting, if, if the math is right, it's like a thousand linear feet more fishing. That's, that's correct. Uh, area than than the existing conditions, um, but the specific mode of the uh, tailgate fishing, 
that's on the ex the existing expanded parking area, that's where that is centered now, correct? Right. So if you look at this exhibit, you can kind of see there's these black hash marks with the little brackets. Uh, that shows where tailgate fishing currently exists, uh, as well as the white lines. Right. Um, and the white is showing those conflict zones where the pathway is, you know, seven feet or less and can't feasibly accommodate both access. Mm -hmm. um, and in, the, uh, in the, the proposed plan, you can see there's spaces down by the lifeguard section, uh, the east promenade, and then out past uh, Stegnaros that could all have sufficient width to accommodate both access and tailgate fishing. So just in summary, we're getting 1,000 more linear feet of fishing access in general, roughly. Oh, fishing in general, yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so some of my questions um, were answered by your uh, presentation uh, about about sea lion viewing and also about the the tailgate fishing, which of course I think for a lot of us we have very mixed feelings about. I know I went through a period of my son's life where we were there every chance we got it, and also a period of extreme frustration trying to get through it with a stroller. Um, you know, so we, so, but I think I understand where that is and how it is that we're actually producing more with the West Walkway. Um, you alluded to um, uh, funding, and um, and I, I wonder if you could speak more to that. Um, I know that this is a time where we we actually have some funding available. And um, it's extremely frustrating to not have a plan um, that allows it. I mean, it is, it is, I mean, I know from my years of trying to put funding together for projects, it's extremely important. Um, do you have any insight into um, timing of funding opportunities? Or um, can you tell us any more about funds that are available or could be available? Right. So the... Um you know, as we all know, if you've been paying to, to the federal government, right. uh, as a result of the pandem pandemic, there are tr billions, probably trillions of dollars of public infrastructure funds that are now uh, out there. Um, several of them have already had multiple rounds and are partway through their award life. Uh, so those, those opportunities are dwindling uh, each year that goes by. Um, some of them are five-year programs. There's a few that are 10, if I recall. Um, but most of them, uh, you know, have already... A lot of them have already expended funding, uh, and so we're, we're losing out on a, a sort of a generational opportunity uh, for infrastructure funds from the federal government minimally. Uh, the state has also uh, invested heavily in climate adaptation and climate resilience projects the past few years. Agencies like the Coastal Conservancy and the um, state parks and, and others are providing funds uh, through like the, the boating access program and things like that. Uh, but as you probably also know, the state is grappling with a, I want to say it's like a $30 billion budget shortfall. And so a lot of these programs are being scaled back. And the opportunities are here now, uh, while they've already been appropriated and, and, and are available. Uh, but as we look out a year or two, it's very likely that these windows will close. Uh, so it's, it's crucially important that we do get, uh, get the opportunity to put our, name in, our hat in the ring and, and try and bring money to the wharf while this opportunity is here. Um, but again, as I've said, in order to do that, we need to have an, an approved environmental review or a certified environmental review, the AR in this case, or a, um, a, and a master plan. Uh, the, the, the master plan itself was actually created uh, through funding from the Economic Development Administration because they noted we didn't have a plan that would allow them to fund projects. So we didn't have the required review and the required uh, vision uh, for them to put money at, for infrastructure. So they've paid for the plan. 12 years ago. And so here we are, missing out on over a decade of opportunity, um, even as we see the climate getting more intense and the damage uh, occurring. Thank you. Yeah. With our staff, that's not a hat in the ring. That's a heavyweight boxer in the ring. I'd like to say we're very good at getting grant money when we have the plans in place. Sorry, that was a comment, Sean. All right. Uh, just a couple questions um, at the very beginning of the thank you again for your presentation no. um, at the very beginning of it there was the the um, financial uh, graph that you put up and just out of my because I'm not aware the 
I would assume that uh, most of the expenses would be maintenance and ops, but it's not in this case. And I'm wondering what does the purple line really represent as far as what kind of expenses is the war fix accruing? Right. So the, uh, the, the, the majority is, it's just slightly over half, but it is the majority still. Um, but the, uh, the remainder is marine safety or the marine rescue uh, uh, and parking. Okay. So both uh, parking generates revenue for the wharf as well. Uh, all of them exist in Fund 104, which is part of the general fund, um, and they're all all the revenues generated at the wharf go back into that fund mm -hmm. and pay for you know towards the operating costs, um, but they're insufficient to provide you know fully cover maintenance, parking, and the marine rescue operations. Right, that was what yeah I was I was like what is this what's that second the additional part. Um, then my other question too is with regards to maintenance operations, having talked to a few of the workers there, right now it seems like there's no maintenance happening. Correct? Is that correct? No, I mean they're they're with they're regards they're, to sorry with regards to like the bird mitigation issues. Is that right? And you're correct on that. The, 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 there's challenges with it. I wouldn't right. say there's okay. none. Okay. Um, but through our maintenance permit with the with the Coastal Commission, uh, there are restrictions on when uh, they can conduct major work. That's timing. Timing. Related. Yeah. So basically, from uh, March 15th to August 1st, uh, nothing louder than a hand drill is supposed to be used, uh, except unless it's absolutely needed. Okay. So they're not allowed to drive piles or do major deck work, any of that during the favorable summer weather uh, or even spring. Uh, and so they have to pack that into the winter months uh, when storms create unreliable conditions for repaving and all sorts yeah. of other things. Yeah, um, that sounds like it. The, uh, the restrictions also put, a, I want to say it's a 150-foot bird exclusion zone. Mm -hmm. So if there's an active nest, they can't do work around that. Uh, so they're very strict regulations we have to deal with just from that, right. that agency. Other uh, federal agencies add additional considerations. Seems like that would, as we're talking about expanding and doing a lot more construction uh, with this plan, there's gonna be some issues there maybe, huh? Yeah, there, it's certainly a concern. My understanding is once a project begins, it's not so limited as long as you're, you're monitoring and you're adapting if, if the presence of animals is there. Mm -hmm. um, but the... Um, but yeah, I mean, it's a consideration. You wouldn't be able to start a project in the middle of that exclusion month, right. uh, is what we'd anticipate. Great, thanks. And then, uh, not I saw the picture of the Capitola Wharf getting uh, affected by uh, weather. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering, what is the height difference between the Capitola Wharf and the Santa Cruz Wharf? I as far as the main deck height. Yeah, I believe um, the engineering report states that it's 19 feet and we're at 23 typically. That's 19 feet? Yeah, okay. I believe that's what the, it's in the engineering report and I think that's what it said. Okay. So it's pretty close. It's not, yeah. it's only five, five. Yeah, it, it five did work out difference. favorably in the sea level rise uh, projections that are included in the engineering report because mm -hmm. we, you know, we're already above similar wharves or, or nearby wharves, so we had a little room to, for the oceans to rise. Great. Thanks, that's all my questions, thanks. All right, good questions. I had three, and I have like one and a half left. Uh, one is, I'm so glad you showed that pile plan. I just thought that public comment from Renee Flower was really interesting with the history. Uh, Julie touched on it already, but um, I pulled out of the staff report some words um, just regarding the urgency of this, so I wanted to underscore those again if you've got them up. They're just, these are, this is directly out of the staff report. It's just on a slide so you all can see it. And um, yeah, just that delay for several years that, that we're missing this uh, infrastructure opportunity, that just got me in the heart and uh, emphasized the need to move this along, in my opinion. So that's like, you can't predict the chicken that didn't hatch, but it's a pretty safe to say, like we may have lost out on there's X great million interest. dollars, can you say? Uh, I mean, there's great interest uh, from agencies, but they haven't been able to fund any of these projects. Um, we submitted, uh, I think we had an eight and a half million dollar grant to, to state parks um, back when the plan was approved that, mm -hmm. you know, I don't know that we would have gotten it because of that, but it didn't help that we didn't, that the EIR got challenged. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, and then there's the, the, we've also applied for, I think, some of the boating design and things like that with the Wildlife Conservation Board. Uh, again, the, 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 is it causal that we didn't have the plan? Um, I mean, it certainly disqualified us, I guess, would be the, 
Yeah, I, I'm just reflecting on the difference in climate stuff and transportation and recreation, particularly looking out here at Parks and Rec. Right. Like, we are a world from where we were in 2014, in my opinion, on both those areas. Right, we've been tremendously so successful in bringing those funds in, and, and this is such an iconic facility. I, I, I think we'd be highly competitive mm -hmm. uh, with the environmental report and the plan behind us. Yeah, I mean, it seems to me like that, that loop trail would feed right into the rail trail and all that awesomeness we got going on. So that's just my opinion. Uh, my second one um, is that that other uh, quote that I just copy pasted so it'd be up here in front of everybody. Moving into public comment, I just wanted to go through very carefully again what our scope here is. Because like this is super interesting and I can go on all day about bird nesting habitat and all this stuff, the history appeals to me, the war, you know, everything is just great. But before we get into public comment, I wanted to go real tight on our scope tonight. And I think this kind of sums it up there in the middle of that. So could you just review again, like what we're here to rule on specifically? I think uh, Sabrina can at least speak to it from a legal perspective. Yeah, that'd be great. Um, Hi, Sabrina. Hi. Welcome. Uh, good evening. I'm Sabrina Teller with uh, Remy Moose Manley outside Secret Council to the city on this and other matters. Um, so, Essentially, the posture that the city is in right now as a result of it having rescinded the prior plan adoption and certification of EIR is that while only certain portions of the EIR were revised and, and augmented, the city council ultimately has to consider whether to readopt the plan as proposed or with you know their own additions as well as to whether to now certify again this expanded EIR. And so your role is essentially similar to the role, you know, from three years ago where you are making a recommendation or not <laughs> to the council that the EIR is adequate in your view, should be certified, and that the plan should be uh, approved as revised. That's the staff recommendation for your action. Of course, you're free to take, you know, any of, you're free to do that recommendation or, or come up with a different one. Yeah, you know, the words that I was looking at uh, were like a new analysis of the recreation and related land use policies, uh, blah, blah, blah. Is this going to impact our prior decisions? You know, I, I just rereading that, like we put a lot of work into this and where I assume we're limited, but let's say I want to make the big warehouse pink. You know, would that trigger a new EIR? Like, how much could we monkey with it? Um, Just like in theory. So you are not limited, I think, in what, I mean, I think you're only limited by what the scope of your function as a planning commission is. So if your recommendations are within your function, as I, laid I out in the ordinance, then on an objective standard you can of. recommend, I think, whatever you would like. Okay. So if there are design changes that you now think are a good idea that, you know, the previous commission didn't suggest, or, uh, you know, if you have different view from your, your prior commission, you're not bound by their prior recommendation, in other okay. words. I mean, we're a different commission today, too. Right. This point I of fact, think Sean. if I'm make it, if it makes it more clear for me, it's, we can, uh, like you said, recommend maybe a slight change to the master plan. At that point, would it would be that would we amend the EIR at that point to send it to if we were to if that was to happen, which I'm not saying it is, you would amend the EIR just based around those changes, but you would pretty much still maintain the majority of what all the the current EIR that we have, right? Is that correct? I th My I th thinking. I think you'd most likely amend the master plan. The EIR analysis is complete as it is, right. uh, and the bulk of it hasn't changed. No new impacts have been okay. identified. Uh, but you could recommend changes to the master plan as a result of that analysis or, you know, the, the commission's discretion. Okay. okay. Thanks. If I could clarify, I, I don't think that what you recommend necessarily triggers right now any change to the EIR because the council would then have to act on that recommendation. Mm -hmm. Now, if they chose to adopt a recommendation that substantially changed uh, the plan and what was assumed for the environmental impacts, then the council might have to consider whether the EIR is ready to certify in light of the changes that they might carry forward from your recommendation, or they might decide it's fine. I would also add that, you know, consider what's been studied within the outside parameters of the projects. Yeah. Yeah. So lesser projects, 
within the scope of the IR wouldn't necessarily trigger. Right. So, for example, the original plan was proposing a 45 height, 45 foot height limit for the landmark buildings, um, and then the council later reduced that to a height of 40. But because that was in the maximum envelope that was already studied, that didn't trigger a change in the EIR because it was a, like a reduction in the height. But thank you for that clarification because we do have a bit of leeway to like yes. give recommendations. They're not like official until the council adopts them, kind of as usual. Yep. Thank you. All right. Well, now I would like to take a deep breath and open the public. Oh, I'm sorry, John. Yeah. I may have missed it, but is there any discussion of potential for employment uh, opportunities, given that we're talking about a large area increase and, according to the description, a, an increase in the diversity and number of types of establishments that are going to be out on, on the wharf? Is, is, there, has, is there any analysis that's been done on that? There was a, a preliminary economic analysis that was prepared in 2013 that largely looked at existing conditions and needs and opportunities, mm -hmm. uh, not so much quantifying the impacts of the, the economic potential of the master plan. Okay. Uh, that's an analysis that hasn't been done because we don't have a, a project to base it on, really. Yeah, I was thinking specifically in regard to employment, just in terms of yeah, you know, if the it, changes that are being proposed. Right, so if it were a linear path and you proposed an extra you know 30 percent of of commercial uses mm -hmm. it's probably 120 uh, just assuming a linear but it, it's not necessarily going to be you know okay align with that thanks yeah sean almost glanced over my first question that i had while i was writing all the other ones down um it was brought to my attention and i don't know if this is true that with the gate signage that the entrance of that was in the original master plan um, <clears throat> by the, it was brought to my attention that the crane might not fit underneath the uh, that proposed, the crane that is used for replacing the pilings. Has that been right. talked about? It has. That's a, one of the things that we've identified in the, um, uh, in the process of doing the Miramar retrofits okay. uh, was that getting heavy equipment out there is a consideration that wasn't anticipated by the designers. Uh, so in all likelihood, we'll take a look at this plan uh, for the, the structure. We'll look at modifying it within its envelope right. um, and or reducing certain elements of it in order to provide that access. Seems like important and important. Yeah, it's a very, <laughs> it's a, it's an important one. It's like, definitely one that, uh, uh, you know, it, it just shows that. All the details. The details, yeah. 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 Thank you for that. I was wondering, I just hadn't, wasn't sure where we were with the. Yeah, Awareness no, it, it can be worked within this plan with, mod you know, reasonable modifications, but Probably. there'll be a public process for the sign as well, and so between the two, uh, we should have the opportunity to, to accommodate that. Yeah, thanks. And we can keep the questions coming all night, so. Um, as a master plan is, it's often just sketched in. Right. All right, so now I'd like to open the uh, forum for the public hearing. I know some people came in a little bit after my opening comments, but I wanted to welcome everybody to come speak. Um, I'm going to limit public comment tonight to two minutes. Tess, did we get a request from anybody for additional time? Uh, don't morph the wharf, Jillian, or I'm sorry, sir, I forgot your name. How, like in an ideal world, how much time would you like? All right, I'll give you four. Mm -hmm. And the process here is uh, come on up if you can and sign in on the side. It's technically optional to state your name, but we do like to hear your name um, if you want to state it. And uh, again, if someone has said your comment three times, it might not be worth coming up just to say it over and over again. Truly, I appreciate you all coming out and your opinions on these matters. Good evening, Gillian Greenside, and I'm representing the community group Don't Morph the Wharf. I'm also speaking for the two and a half thousand people who signed this petition after an op-ed in the Sentinel described the wharf master plan changes about which the community was unaware. 400 people also added personal comments 
with urgent pleas for the city to keep the current character, historic look and feel of the wharf. I'm struck by the difference between the public process now underway for the redesign of the San Lorenzo Park and the way the wharf master plan was developed. For the San Lorenzo Park, the public is involved every step of the way and the design team is presenting several options that reflect public preference. By contrast, the Wharf Master Plan was developed by a San Francisco design firm with a $1 million grant from the city via the Commerce Department and originally intended for wharf repairs. The plan was presented as a fait accompli and since then, no matter how strong the public opposition, little has changed. A major fact needs stressing, the, and the attorney clarified, but it needs stressing. The court ordered that the 2020 Wharfmaster Plan and EIR be rescinded. That means cancelled. What you are deciding on tonight is a new Wharfmaster Plan and a new EIR. It's a new game. You can, if you choose, vote to remove, change or cancel anything within the Wharf Master Plan. The Historic Preservation Commission voted to remove the Western Walkway, which is alternative two. Part of their motion reads, the proposed lengthy, highly visible walkway would degrade the visual character of the wharf by introducing an appendage to the wharf that is incompatible with its original historical design. The city concluded that alternative two is the environmental, environmentally superior alternative that met all project objectives. On this issue, the court ruling stated, quote, before an environmentally superior alternative may be rejected, as infeasible, the record must contain substantial evidence that the rejected alternative is truly infeasible, end of quote. Further in the court order that was uh, based on the engineering report that was read by the court, the comment was that all of the um, preservation of the wharf could be achieved without the Western Walkway. And the city has not, since that ruling, presented any compelling evidence for the infeasibility of alternative two. This is not opinion. This is a careful examination of the facts. In conclusion, we would suggest as a positive step forward for approving a Wharf Master Plan and EIR, that we ask you support, or your support, for the Santa Cruz Bird Club, the Sierra Club, and the Historic Preservation Commission in voting to adopt Alternative 2. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Hi, my name is John Bombacci. I'm the most recently retired wharf supervisor. So I've got 40 years of working experience out on the wharf and 62 years as a, as a user of the wharf. Uh, I caught my first fish out on the wharf when I was six years old. So have a great deal of love and respect for the wharf and uh, spent a lot of time trying to preserve it. And I just want to say that everything that is in this master plan was well thought through. Uh, it, it took a great deal of, of um, input from myself and the best engineers in the business. And the Western Walkway is really an important integral part of this plan. The idea here is to essentially wrap the wharf that we have today in a cocoon, more or less, of new construction 
Now, you know, say, why do that? Well, it'll reduce the lateral movement, which is the biggest, that dry rot and rust are the biggest enemies of the wharf. It will reduce that lateral movement. It'll provide more public space in doing so. It'll provide a tremendous safety factor where firefighting is concerned and moving people in case of an emergency. It, our technology today for fasteners is so much better than what exists in the center of the wharf now that it would buy us just so much time to do the necessary repairs to that structure that this is really just, this is gold in terms of, of a maintenance uh, plan going forward, a way to maintain the wharf's resilience. Finish your thought. Made a way to maintain the wharf's resilience into the, the upcoming um, more difficult climate extremes that we're likely to see. I mean, Henry Bernier developed a magnificent structure, but I want to say I've heard comment that, that, you know, we need to preserve this for because this is the way Henry Brunier designed it. And I'll tell you that everything I know and have read about Henry Brunier, he was a civil engineer. His interest was in building the best, most resilient structure that he could imagine. This was built as Santa Cruz's finest wharf, or not Santa Cruz, California's finest wharf. And... I can only imagine that he would agree wholeheartedly with his plan to preserve this structure into the future, and this is the best way to do it. And I can, and I'll just offer that if you have any questions about maintenance over the last 40 years, I'd be happy to answer them. Uh, my name is Aldo Giacchino. I have um, enjoyed and uh, admired the wharf for the past 24 years, which is how long I've lived in Santa Cruz. And um, the aesthetic qualities are just going to be destroyed by, by, by what is being proposed. You know, this is a fine racing horse, and what is being proposed is what they used to do in the Middle Ages to find horses. They would wrap them in steel, and as a consequence, they would become overburdened and incapable of performing the original function. So, aesthetically, this is an abortion, really. Commercially, it is maintained that one of the reasons to, uh, to uh, build the additional walkways is to attract more people um, so that the wharf can make more money. Well, this is like building a lot of um, retail and service stores on the frontage of Front Street and then asking every newcomer to take a walk on the levee. You know, if you, are, if you, if you want more business, you don't put them at the rear, facing the rear of the stores. The wharf commerce is enhanced by having a concentration of people at the front end of the stores, not at the back. And then let me just answer one, one thing about the belly aching that I've heard tonight about the public having delayed this project from going forward for, for years. That delay is caused by the ineptitude of the staff in this commission, not you necessarily as individuals, but the commission over time. Had the, or the original, the commission over time and the staff listened to the public comments early on, they wouldn't have had three years of useless battle and over half a million dollars of expense to the city. Thank you. Hello, I'm Andrea Rosenfeld. I was born and raised in Santa Cruz, and I'm a part of Dorn Martha Wharf, and I agree with everything that Jillian spoke to you about. 
And I'd just like to point out a few things that are important to me. Um, the 40-foot building at the end of the wharf, I think, is an abomination. And at the meetings in 2016, or whenever it was, and we discussed this previously, they basically ignored all public comment about how much we were adamantly opposed to that level 45 or 40, it doesn't matter. And he basically said, the city representative basically said, oh, it'll give us more options for funding. We won't necessarily do it, but you know, it'll give us more options. And we're like, no, we don't want that. And I'd like to ask all of you to go over to East Cliff and look at the view back at our wharf and imagine a white building that goes up beyond anything you can see on the wharf. It'll start to cover Lighthouse Point and your view. And originally, they spoke about how the architectural integrity of the wharf needed to be maintained because of the new plan and everything needed to be congruent. And yet, they have the Dolphin Restaurant, which is low. And next to it, they're willing to put a 40 or 45 foot building. So at that time, they're trying to sell us on the idea that they're trying to create, you know, visual congruency. And yet, I don't know what they're gonna do with a dolphin. Maybe they'll get rid of it and build it again. But the point is, they were just trying to make their plan. They didn't listen to us. And I believe they're still not listening to us. And I also did not like the fact that it's unclear, it was unclear what was going to be in that building. I believe it's going to be retail. And I also disagree that we need a huge 20 or 40 foot building at the entrance to the wharf, which is also going to be like, what do you do with that space? How many brochures can you fit in that space? How many people can you have in there promoting the, the whale tours? How big of a building do you need at the front of our wharf to achieve that goal? And I'd like you to think about how our wharf will look with this plan. Thank you. Hello, my name is John Aird. It's true I've been part of Don't Morph the Wharf, but I'd like my permission just as an individual to speak to the process here. No problem. I was the CEO of a major corporation, major organization for 35 years. So I know what planning is about, and I know what approvals of boards are about, <coughs> and commissions, and city uh, councils. So I would like to say this. What is striking here is that the focus of staff has been all legalistic. The focus to the letter and the response to the letter was a legalistic, was 70% legalistic. That's not what this is about. This is a public hearing about community views and about community values. What is really telling about the planning here is not only what has been stated earlier that the Planners have not really listened to the public. But if you look at the summary of project objectives, there is nothing in this about preserving the historic value and the character of the iconic wharf in the interests of the community writ large. Nothing. You read the nine, and it's about <laughs> other things. You would think that would be the top of the list. So you've got what was driving this, which was driven by staff, and I say this should be reviewed and recalibrated to fit the community's interests and the character and integrity and fit to Santa Cruz should be at the top of the list. Thank you very much.
Thank you. My name is Mark Trabing. I grew up here and uh, had a career in local government in Southern California. Oh, ignore that. Uh, despite the immense amount of time that's gone into this, I'm, I'm concerned about the future of the wharf. Um, I, I see um, San Francisco and Pier 39. I see Monterey and their and their Cannery Row, and I'm sure they had immense development plans and so forth. But in my opinion, they they gave up a lot when they developed those uh, their waterfront. These are beloved waterfronts just described in fiction by Jack London and Steinbeck and so forth. And to me, they've could have done better instead of. Um, you know, putting in a lot of cheesy uh, retail, in my opinion, and, and entertainment and so forth. They could have done better. <clears throat> Maybe they're successful from an economic development point of view. Maybe they bring in a lot more revenue. But that's not the only uh, value that comes from an iconic uh, place like the wharf. Um, The community has lost so much in the last year, you know, in, in the various wharves and cement ship and big basin and so forth. So many changes going on. And like a developer that's very well respected in town told me, the town you knew it is, is not going to be here anymore. It's time for a big change. I'm not opposed to change, but, you know, there's, there's so much change. I just ask you to give us uh, something to hang on to. Um, and minimize the improvements such as the Western Walkway and so forth. I think you'll all agree that you're, you know, that we're all, all happy that we didn't um, develop Lighthouse Field uh, long ago. And maybe it's one of those moments where, in the future, uh, they'll, you know, people will look back and say, "Well, it's so great that you know we didn't morph the wharf." Um, I, I just on the way here, I, I picked up a painting that's been in my family for a long time. The wharf painted by a local painter, Madge uh, Elliott, in the 60s. And, and this is the view you see um, when you're down in the water. I looked at it, surfing cows as growing up and so forth, and looking through there over, over to the, uh, the great uh, boardwalk and so forth. But, I, you know, if we take the improvements that were, some of them that we're um, considering tonight, uh, you know, it wouldn't look like this uh, anymore. But uh, anyway, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. All right, would anyone else like to speak? I will now then close the public hearing, and I'd like to give staff an opportunity to respond or rebut to any public comment if they'd like to. I would just, uh, go ahead. You don't have to, you can if you want. Okay, um, I mean, I'm happy to answer any additional questions concerning legal issues. I mean, regarding the comment that the responses were overly legalistic, it's because the comments were asserting legal issues and legal flaws, which warranted a response. Um, I would defer to Dave on any Well, isn't it the city didn't file the CEQA lawsuit? Correct. For example. Uh, I think the, the only two comments I have are related to Ms. Greensight's commentary earlier. First, I would just uh, note that the, the petition that she held up the preamble and the rationale for it that are described in the, the call to petition, I guess is maybe what you'd call it, uh, were specific to requiring an EIR, not to rejecting the plan. It's not to say there weren't comments made uh, to that effect, uh, but th what the petition actually asked for was requiring an EIR, and that is what has been done. Um, and then the other was the statement that the, the court said that there were alternatives to the Western Walkway. You know, what the court actually said was that there was no evidence that other things couldn't achieve the same goals. So a lack of evidence does not say that there are alternatives, it just says there was not evidence in the record to say that, to disqualify those alternatives. So uh, beyond that, I appreciate the public comment and the painting. All right, so uh, now I'll bring it back up to the commission for further questions, a motion, comments, speech making, anything? Mm -hmm. uh, Commissioner Conway. Okay. Uh, first of all, thank you everybody for coming. I appreciate that. And I want to thank um, the city team, the whole team, um, for the report. And especially um, 
for crafting the project objectives, and thank you for having them up there, that I think they do reflect the values and aspirations of our community. Um, and I myself am so excited about the possibilities in this plan. Um, it provides the opportunity to make our beloved wharf safer, more focused on people instead of cars, um, and safe transportation. And it provides the opportunity for viable and exciting businesses, and also to protect the wharf, making it better prepared to face the increasing stresses um, brought on by climate change. And I appreciate that. Um, but um, we've been asked specifically uh, to address the west side walkway. Um, and I'd like to initiate that discussion. Um, I had to chart out the pros and cons from all of the various information. And I read everything multiple times. Um, and uh, uh, as I weighed all the information. Um, so here's where I end up. Um, the reasons to include the Western Walkway. It expands public access in exciting ways by providing a new intimate connection with the bay on the windward side. It provides an enhanced pedestrian environment, allowing walkers to circumnavigate the wharf, and it adds really needed ADA access to the water um, and also for the promenade. It improves public safety in a number of ways, separating pedestrians and bikes from cars, as well as emergency access. Um, I guess I already said that. Um, it enhances public safety through better emergency and fire response access. And it expands fishing while eliminating conflict from the tailgate fishing while still leaving that responsible or available. I find the engineering report compelling, and I won't quote at length here beyond uh, saying um, the Western Walkway will help our wharf withstand challenges of climate change, and the commercial structures and operations on the wharf make it lively and vital. The Western Walkway helps to protect them. We need vital businesses. That's why people go out there. Um, and finally, what I'd like to say is it's important to have a plan as soon as possible. And because of that, I move that the Planning Commission recommend that the City Council adopt A, the draft resolution to the City Council of the City of Santa Cruz certifying the final environmental impact report for the Santa Cruz Wharf Master Plan, and B, the resolution of the City of uh, Council of the City of Santa Cruz adopting findings of fact and a mitigation monitoring and reporting program the re for the revised Wharf Master Plan and C, the revised Santa Cruz Wharf Master Plan as may be subject to modifications considered by City Council. Thank you, Commissioner Conway. Do you have a second for that motion? Second. Uh, thank you. Let's move on to further discussion. Headed towards a vote. Um, so with the with regards, I mean, to me, there's a few different things going on. The Western Walkway is one of them. <clears throat> I've been in discussion with a few members of the community, uh, some of uh, John's uh, ex or former employees, I should say, that still work for the wharf. Um, and they seem to, I did not hear one of the people I talked to that currently are working for the wharf uh, be in favor of the Western Walkway. I asked why um, they, having their experience um, with repairing, especially because the Western side does receive the biggest brunt of the logs when we do get the wood coming out into the bay, it wraps around the wharf and then comes back and kind of comes into the western side. And I think from what I could understand, I'm not having not the experience of, of maintenance on that, tried to understand why they wouldn't be in favor of that, aside from all the benefits that there is, because I do see the, the access. And, um, but it seems like safety concerns would be one of them, especially um, my, my logical construction knowledge would seem to think if we are attempting to protect 
if we know that we're going to be impacted on that side of the war. <laughs> Siri thinks I'm talking. <laughs> Um, it's not just you, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> right. Someone else is here. Um, so, so, so to get back to that, with the lower, the lowering of it um, and, and bringing it down closer to the water, it seems like that we are going to be constantly repairing that, um, especially every year that we have an extreme weather event. Um, to me, I'm wondering... Are we just kicking the can down the road by instead of repairing what would need to be repaired? And I understand under the pilings underneath buildings are much, I mean, they can't be replaced, but they can be repaired from what I have understood. Um, so I'm just wondering if, John, if you're willing to address from your point of view why some of the people that work for the war that I spoke with are not in favor and why you would rebut that. I want to say, based on the experience of what has happened to some of our landings in the past that are lower, right. but not that low, based on the construction of those landings, which was improper from the get-go, mm. uh, you might arrive at that conclusion. But a properly constructed west walkway would not have those issues. I'm not going to say that there's never going to be damage there, and there's not going to be times when you'll need to close that walkway for public safety. You will. But there is such a thing as sacrificial barrier. Okay? So would you have to repair that every year? Absolutely not. Uh, the way it's going to be designed, it will attenuate a lot of wave pressure. Um, and so it will essentially flatten out a lot of waves that would otherwise hit that side with full impact. Um, right, so I, that, sorry to cut you off, but I, the question I guess to, for you exactly is I understand the idea of why it's there now and why mm -hmm. we want it there. But my question is, do you just, to play the devil's advocate, in sure. your mind, why would current, I, I hear you're saying because of their experience with the other lower landings and the, the way that they were constructed Correct. and seeing what happens to them, they would assume that that would, would, would happen to this structure, but because of the future, like because of current technologies, that maybe it would be lessened, the damage would be lessened. That's Absolutely. Correct. Okay. correct. That, that, that was the main, I was just trying to understand from your perspective why, you know, that our, you would argue that. Our building technology is just so much better today. I, I work in construction, so I totally know. I get it. Um, thanks to Simpson. It's um, a good question. That was a big investment. Yeah. And so my, the, the Western Wharf to me, I, I can see, I thanks Julie for your note your number by number because that just was very succinct and easily digestible like these are why this is why it's good um my main thing w was just the question that i had of like why people would be against it i mean i've heard from the don't mourn the wharf that there's bird uh concerns uh, and that's that's okay um I think that's a hard one because it's you're balancing a lot of you know what you're you have to there's trade-offs the one thing on which i don't see the trade-off in is the landmark building and i was on the 2020 planning commission and i definitely did not from i listened to the community at that time uh around the inclusion of the landmark building and i would agree that I don't think it's really necessary in the f in the massive plan that we're looking at now. Um, so, you know, I think uh, my views, and I don't think anybody's views have really changed in the three years since then. I don't see it as a, tr a tremendous loss um, when I'm looking at the, the the entirety of this project. And I think having listened to the community on multiple levels, not just the don't, don't morph the war folks, but just people in general walking my 
well, you know, I, I have, my wife worked on the wharf for pretty much more than, probably about half of her life, you know? Um, and so but everybody has this ad attachment and there is gonna be some level of, we're gonna have to upgrade, we have to make it safer, we have to, we wanna save, you know, we also wanna save it, we wanna be able to use it. Um, but at the same time, we don't wanna, there's that balance of not wanting to just go completely in the other direction of changing it to the point where we don't recognize our, our historical, you know, place, landmark. So um, at this point, I mean, I would be um, w wondering if there would be, if I could make a motion to amend the motion on the floor to remove the landmark building and if you would be amenable to that as a friendly amendment. No. Okay. All right. Mike? Yeah, thank you to city staff, the public, everybody for coming out tonight to look at this incredibly important local landmark. Um, I'll just start by saying that I share some of the concerns of um, Commissioner Maxwell. I share some of the concerns about the Western Walkway um, as well. But ultimately, at the end of the day, the way I see this is that the wharf is uh, a financial drain on the city. And if we want to continue to enjoy this particular landmark as it currently exists, we're going to need to make some changes to preserve it. Part of those preservations are going to be dealing with climate change and creating a barrier for said Western walkway. And um, I would much rather, from a financial perspective, from pretty much any perspective, uh, repair a walkway rather than the wharf itself with the businesses on top of it. So that would be an incredibly deep financial commitment. And so our options here are essentially to leave things as they are in many ways and to suffer the consequences of those choices or to, as uh, a member of the public said, is to essentially cocoon it, as I heard it. <laughs> and so um, doing that, I think, is the best move. And um, at the end of the day, if we can also, while securing funding from various levels of government, enhance these project objectives and make the wharf a little bit more enjoyable for the people that want to go to it, I think that is a win-win. Um, I do share the concerns about um, the landmark building, and I'm just going to make a couple comments about that. Um, I think that the sea lion viewing holes are an incredibly important local cultural spot. Um, I've been going to that since I was a kid. Um, I, you know, have taken my students there, and I think it is one of the first places where many kids specifically can connect uh, marine life to their own lives. And so I'm incredibly protective of those particular sea lion holes, even though they're originally fishing holes. Um, I get that, but, um, I have concerns about that and I would just like that to be noted. I don't want to move those at all. I think they're fine the way they are. And if that means changes to the landmark building, then I think that that is the far less, um, harmful alternative in my opinion. My second comment would be around the entryway sign. And my only concern about that is that the only sign that I can remember in my 40 years of living here was the one on River Street. That didn't go so well. So I would like particular attention to be drawn to that particular piece of this project in the design phase. <laughs> because to end up with another you know, I mean, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that was a million dollar sign that we put there. I hate that sign. I've hated that sign since it got put up. And I don't want to look at another one of those. And I doubt many members of the public do either. So with that said, um, I, you know, I wish I could third this motion. I think it's a great project. And um, I think the Western Walkway, as uh, staff is looking for comments about it, I think it would be an awesome addition. I do have a small thought that, you know, when I'm at Olitas or at Rivas or at any of those places, all I see other than uh, the coast is railing and birds. And if there's going to be a walkway directly below that point, it seems to me that a lot of people are going to get pooped on. So um, I would consider that too in the walkway situation. Um, and I think I'm going to hold my comments there. So thank you. 
Great comments. Thank you. Anyone else? Question. Yeah, sure. Uh, Commissioner Paul Hamas, in your um, comments of not moving the the viewing ports, which I totally agree with and took my kids there. We've all, I mean, I think that's, for some reason, those are like, the, we could, if that was it. But my question to you is, you said that you would be, you would not want them to be moved at this point. Is that correct? That's my I mean, the way I interpreted the staff report is that the language that's been put in the wharf master plan has basically said to either not move them or to move them to a place that is enhanced or better. I don't see, you know, I mean, and as I interpreted the answer to my question, better would be according to public sentiment. Right. Right. And I think that public sentiment is going to be one of the strongest barriers to a bad plan. On that, I think that I'm not the only person that feels this way. I think we all probably feel this way about that particular landmark on the wharf. Not so much. <laughs> um, so I, I hear you. I'm not sure I'm willing to make a motion to eliminate the landmark building, but I am. I did want to put it in the record that I feel strongly about that, and I would just send those thoughts on to council. Um, in my conversations with people, I think that um, there's you know, pretty, pretty good awareness of, I, I think, this particular aspect of the project. And I think that, um, you know, if, if it was proposed to cover those up, uh, <laughs> I would not want to be the person presenting that. <laughs> yeah. Well, you might come up with some friendly language for an amendment to present. I don't know while others talk. Well, <laughs> yeah. Let's yeah. see if That's people are mean about it. I was it. going to. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have a, a motion and a second, and the language in the Wharf Master Plan. Can we bring that up by chance? Oh, there it is. Sorry, it's late. <laughs> it's good. Yeah, do, do I need to zoom in more? He's your, yeah, you're Johnny on the spot with that, for sure. Okay. Uh, da, 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 da. Any reason to preserve character of the wharf is determined through community engagement. So, to the greatest extent <laughs> possible, or relocate to a place of greater access and viewing quality. There we go. So... Well, and, and, and through the, I have some more comments if you want to think about it. And yeah, I, I don't think I'm ready to start a, a amending plan language right now. I think, you know, as I am reading this, this I'm comfortable with this personally. Um, you know, I wish to the greatest extent possible was a little bit more definitive, but at the same time, we are really early in this plan, and I would hate to pigeonhole the entire situation based on um, what we know now, you know, maybe later down the line, there's a council that has to deal with some unforeseen structural issue or something like that, and uh, or maybe a grant-related issue. And I'm not sure I'm ready to um, narrow the focus of what's possible this early in the plan. So I guess that would just be my comments. Okay, think about it. We're we can add things if we want to. More discussion. I believe that language accommodates a whole range of solutions, including ones that we haven't even thought of. And this is one of the things when you come up with a plan like this, we're creating all new kinds of opportunities for more interactions like that, that are closer to the water, that have peer. I'm, I'm just trying not to put a noose around any particular part of it. Can I just add, sure. um, I'm agreeing with those points and also, you know, just pointing out that this is a plan, it's not a development project. Um, I think the city has made um, a, a, the most salient commitment that it can make in a plan and certainly understands that those are beloved and um, nobody wants to see them go. Um, and so I appreciate your comments about w where we are in the process right now. I should explain myself. I'm a vegetarian, and I think I got poked by a fish hook there, like at a young age. So that's why I don't like them. I think they're great. Other than that, that's my own personal trauma. Um, just to explain it. So I wrote a lot. It was a ton of stuff to go through. I mean, I got quotes and footnotes, and I'm kind of like deleting a lot of that, having heard from a lot of other folks. Um, 
So I have six points. I'll try to go quickly. I have to hurry. Some of the resistance to this plan just struck me as more less true than normal, and that really bugged me. There's just so many things that weren't true. The Wharf Master Plan is widely unpopular. I see the internet petition, but I think that represents one voice, and I don't think it's a majority voice. And I think of all the city council elections that have happened between 2014 and now, and all those opportunities for people to vote in who they want democratically to appoint commissioners and speak. So um, I don't buy it. I think that's a select voice, and it's not a local voice. So I just wanted to state that. Um, that's enough on that negative topic. Uh, one more beef is not believing the engineers. We get a lot of this up here. Like somebody wrote that the walkway would be catapulted into the plate glass windows of the restaurants. And like, I work with engineers daily and that's crazy. You know, that's not gonna happen. So this is setting the table for the cutting edge technology to come to Santa Cruz. Obviously nobody's gonna put in a railing that would harm anybody. Um, so that's all to come. This is just the master plan. So skipping it ahead and coming up with these With well not with respect with these disaster scenarios. We don't need to make up disaster scenarios It just happened on Westcliff. We need to get that puppy in there before a storm comes on that magic angle and Really wipes out our wharf is my opinion. And again, we don't need to make those up. Those are here happening now in my opinion. There's a twisting and like an intentional weirdness around CEQA, and I just wanted to emphasize again that, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, CEQA doesn't require us to pick the environmentally preferable option. It just says if you don't, you need to make sure the effects are mitigated, and that's what I saw in 2016. I don't think anything has, has changed there, but there's this kind of tone with the don't morph the wharf folks of like, well, if you don't pick the most environment, and that's just a misconception, and I wish they would stop spreading those misconceptions. It's complicated enough as it is. Uh, the birds, so I really like have strong concern about the birds, I really do. Um, when I read the staff report, the response to the letter that came out this afternoon, and they said, essentially, the analysis concludes that any potential impacts from human presence will be offset by the expanded wharf and nesting areas available to birds after the expansion, and therefore the impact is not significant. That like hit it for me. Like, yeah, it makes sense to me on some level that people are gonna disrupt the birds, but all those other new parts of the wharf, like. I want to suggest could be designed to be the most awesome bird habitat ever, potentially, if we got a good federal grant for that kind of thing. And there's precedent for that. There's a big, a massive retaining wall that I know Jillian will remember by the sea and sand in the, the years ago the eucalyptus trees kept falling on the beach and stuff. And, you know, we put in language when that project came that said, I don't remember all the details, you guys will put little spots there so the birds can live. And you know, it's fine, and it worked out great, and I've never gone to see if there's birds there, but we'll do all sorts of that stuff with these new projects, and it might be better for the birds. I do want to snarkily remind everyone of the beach bummer list and point out that see birds nesting under the wharf is a lot of the reason we were on that, you know, Cowles Beach is filthy list for a long, long time. So much as I love birds and nesting, I want to be aware of uh, the impact that had on our local economy down to the people washing dishes at the, well, the Miramar is not there anymore, uh, where my brother used to work for many years. So um, well, at the end, I'll suggest a, a friendly amendment, but I wonder if we wanted to add words saying, you know, council, please address optimal seabird nesting with the improvements, something like that. I'd love to give council something to adopt that would address the concerns because they're elected and they always have to like split the baby. So it'd be nice to have something they could get behind. I'm into it. I think we should protect the birds and we should have that walkway there. Okay, let me sum up. Um, access to the water is incredibly important for all Santa Cruzans. Like people I know use the water all the time. I really think those other access points that don't involve going across the beach will like access, accessibility in particular, make it incredibly more accessible on all levels to all people, and I really appreciate that. 
Um, there's some comments like, well, the walkway will be a buzz with people. Yes, that would be because so many people are using it to enjoy the bay that it's a buzz with people. That's more than encouraged. Like, that's why I love this plan. I want people on that walkway. More people are better. No, oh, I had a joke there. If it was the east side walkway, maybe it wouldn't have <laughs> raised as much ire. Excuse me, I couldn't hold that one back. Um, okay, two more, and these are the last ones. Like, time keeps on ticking. Last master plan was 1980. I was four years old at that point. It's been 43 years. Uh, it's a long time ago, but that master plan worked, and we got all those cool things, like the outdoor stage, I think, was the result of that, and the kind of um, Italian-American heritage uh, boat, I forget its name. And the Marcella. So, you know, people just forget that you do a master plan, and you get the money, and you do the improvements, but we do that all the time here, and we just need to do it again, it, while being respectful of the environment and the birds and all that stuff. I mentioned it earlier, think of the difference in thinking climate-wise. Oh my God, like 2014, it was like, well, one day sea level might be a problem, literally. And like, here we are, like, pulling boulders out of Westcliff Drive, you know? So I've always thought climate change is urgent. It's really urgent. Let's get this done. Uh, last and most positive, uh, we have this new transportation mentality, you know? We're going to build a thousand apartments on the deep west side in the next... 10 to 200 years approximately. And I hope those people are not coming down Mission Street in Delaware. I hope they're coming down the rail trail. And I hope at that point, when they get to the awesome roundabout, oh, incidentally, also because we had shovel-ready plans, I don't remember the year, but, um, oh, and the other roundabout, because we had shovel-ready plans, they can just zip through that roundabout, which is a little bit scary on a bike, go out on the wharf and do a loop. So I'm gonna finish with my personal experience, which was hopping on one of the new B-cycles to head down to a council member's kickoff at Vino Wine Bar. And I see you, and I appreciate all the work on the maintenance, but holy God, riding on that wharf on a little e-bike was terrifying. You are not allowed to go on, this, on the, the walkway, reasonably. So I tried that, I broke the lie road right through those signs, and you know, 10 strollers later, it's like, oh God, I'm going in the street. And, You've been there, you all know, when a car goes on one end of the big beam and your bike's on the other, it's like a teeter-totter. And anyway, so um, we need a ton of money to fix that for the next generation, let alone it being knocked around by the waves and everything. So that's why I'm in favor of this plan. I'd like to ask if the maker of the motion would accept a friendly amendment to say that uh, bird nesting Optimal bird nesting shall be considered in the design of the new wharf areas. Or, you know, if, if legal's got any concerns with that. But just so we have some input and they can not adopt it if it's an issue. Mm -hmm. But we get so into this, like, oh, we're having impacts. Let's, let's do something positive and make it better out there. Right. And I think we could, uh, if the commission opts not to put language in, we could make a suggestion to that effect. Uh, the one caveat I would have is, is with those, you know, those tight restrictions from the Coastal Commission regarding work around bird nesting and stuff, there is a risk of, you know, encouraging it to the point that it really impacts. But perhaps there's a way to to focus that in certain areas or something. I I don't know, but uh, it it certainly could be something that is considered. Uh, again, with multiple benefits uh, on projects. Let's leave it there. I, I withdraw that request. Staff, you can talk to council about it or figure something out. I, it's in there already, like all over the place. But uh, yeah, and, and, if we can highlight that a little more, okay. I, I feel that one. I'll look for something that gets to that. Mm -hmm. okay. I know I, we don't need a friendly amendment. Okay, I, and I'm certainly comfortable with emphasizing the concern of the commission for um, bird bird nesting. Um, but I agree with you that um, coastal gives us an awful lot of parameters as it is, and um, it can. Um, so let's not make it harder. So yeah, I appreciate it. No that. problem. Yep. Yeah, I just had a quick question. I'm not sure, really sure who this is for. Um, one thing I've always wondered about the wharf is I don't see a lot of solar out there. Is there is there a reason for that? Right. It's a. Uh... You know, I don't have the, the findings in front of me. Tiffany Wise West, our uh, climate action manager, I think her title's actually changed to a more, even more proactive. Um, she was part of, uh, when she was finishing her PhD, she was part of a, a collaborative between the city and UCSC uh, called the Green Wharf. 
and they did a couple of pilot installations of solar and wind uh, energy out there. And um, you know, while it did generate energy as expected, the challenge of keeping it clean and uh, the materials staying robust against the salt and the wind and all of that uh, was problematic uh, and for both of the devices. However, as we look to new projects um, and the uh, like, the Miramar. As we look to rebuild the Miramar site, uh, we're challenged and we're still sort of exploring what the implications of new state regulations requiring on-site generation will be. Because uh, our understanding is that you know many new commercial projects are going to require energy produced on site, and so we're our architects are or the you know the architects of the the business owner we're, we're negotiating with are looking into that and trying to get to the bottom of, you know, what is it actually is required? How do we achieve it? Uh, is it something like enclosing a wind turbine in a, in a safe space? Uh, or is it looking at solar? Is it looking at tidal energy? Um, it's all sort of uh, a problem that we still have yet to solve, um, but one that's coming up. Um, and we've had some initial conversations with the Department of Energy looking at, you know, solutions they might have and consulting with some of their experts. So. Um, you know, hopefully we'll have a better idea, but it, it, there are challenges out there. Great. Thank you. Yep. Based on my work experience, it's nearly certain that <coughs> PV will be required on any type of building out there. I mean, who knows? Things change. Right. There might be like a swing back, but right now you could like get away with it, but you'd have to spend a ton of money. And if I remember right, in 2014, there was a lot of concern just about structural support because like a lot of those buildings are like, Bespoke, shall we say? Yeah, yeah the lot of them were built a while. They were okay with that windmill. You know, there was a, a, a vertical axis windmill experiment. But when we talked about PV, if I remember right, it was wind shearing coming off the roof, which is now that's a reasonable engineer concern. You know, it's also been discussion about if there's a way to like centralize off-site somehow. But you know, it's it's all very nascent. Uh, you know, early early stage trying to figure it out. But it is going to be a challenge going forward. Quick shout out to Ross, the former climate coordinator, who is super concerned about that thing hitting seagulls for <laughs> obvious reasons. And at, at one of the hearings, he said it's only struck one seagull, and the seagull was stunned and then flew away safely. So they like to stand on it. Sorry, that's still a that history <laughs> story, but yeah. John had a point out if you want to call. Right? John? I just wanted to speak to the, to the windmill because I got a lot of. Do you want to come on up just so folks at home, if anyone's still awake, can hear you? I'm sorry, now I started a so, whole So I worked real thing. closely with Tiffany Weiss West on the Green Wharf, pretty much partners on that. Um, and the solar just doesn't work out because salt schmutz, yeah. seagull poo, corrosion, it's just a tough environment. And it's hard to get it placed exactly right with all the roofs running east and west instead of north and south. So there's a variety of factors why the, why the solar really doesn't work out that well. And the windmill, my God, I'm glad that we, we tried the one small windmill because originally when UCSC came out uh, with a proposal, it was for four that were four times that size. And I just said, whoa, 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 they were going to put them on roofs. And I said, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Let's try one a little bit and see what happens. And I'm glad I did because the design of that windmill created lift. And we ended up having to shut it down in heavy weather events. I mean, when it should have really been cranking up, it was trying to tear the roof off. So basically, it would lift, and then the roof would rebound, and it would lift and rebound and lift and rebound. So that's so there are some issues. If you do, I, I'm I'm not saying that the wind won't work out there. It probably will, but it needs to be mounted independently. Thanks. It's it's always so good to hear from the maintenance folks when you're creating regulations. Uh, that's the beauty of state energy law. They don't care. They're just going to make you put it out there whether or not it corrodes, but you're probably right. Mm -hmm. All right. Are we ready for a vote? Any other questions? Comments? If we are getting ready for a vote, I just want to state on the record that, um, as I said before, I don't see this wharf master plan being, I don't see the landmark building being an integral part of this plan. And if it was to be voted on right now, I would definitely not be voting for it. That being said, I think it's a great plan, everything else. I think that it's a necessary to upgrade. 
Uh, we anybody who's we can go. We should you know everybody knows the state of the wharf how it is now, and then definitely I don't think anybody here thinks it should stay the way it is. Um, potholes and all. So I uh, just want to say for the record, you know I think uh, I hope I don't get to see that building while I live here. Well, you can vote against it if you want. How quickly these things go? There's there's good odds you'll be all right. Uh, but didn't the CEQA lawsuit kind of like settle the building thing? Yeah, the, none Completely of the... Completely and finally, like, done. So what the court ruled was that the analysis of the potential historic resources impacts, aesthetic impacts of basically all of the proposed components, including the landmark building, uh, that that finding of the EIR that it would not have significant adverse impacts on those areas, mm -hmm. that that was not flawed. So that issue cannot be relitigated. Okay. Doesn't mean that yeah, we can still make recommendations you guys couldn't make recommendations either. or that the oh. council might decide something different there. It's within their discretion since they don't currently have an approved plan, they can change the plan. And I would again, just restate for the record that it, it is the outside parameters of what that building could be. And you know, based on uh, Commissioner Palhamas' uh, awareness of the public process for really any project, mm -hmm. you know, if and when a project is proposed there, it could be quite different um, than that proposal. Mm -hmm. Well, I'd like to take a quick moment to uh, thank staff. This is the first time I think we've talked to you, but excellent report. And uh, I love that speed PowerPoint thing you did. That was <laughs> killer. But uh, particularly turning, I mean, we got the, the one letter like two days ago and then that response, I love that quick turnaround. I'm always hitting refresh, you know, at four o'clock before meetings. Oh, yeah. So, <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, thank you for turning that so quickly. All right, let's have a vote. Commissioner Conway? Aye. Maxwell? No. McKelvey? Aye. Paul Hamas? Aye. Chair Kennedy? Enthusiastic aye. All right, so with that, we'll move on to the rest of the agenda, which there's not much there, if I remember right. Busy month. Yeah, we do have a busy month. It's exciting. So, uh, staff, do you have any informational items, or should we talk about future schedule? Sure, I can um, address a few items, uh, give you some updates on a couple items that you've, you've heard, and then get into schedule. Um, the project at 925 River to the city council and uh, they uh, approved it uh, on October 10th. They added some conditions of approval, uh, increasing the step backs on the south and west elevation, reducing the floor to ceiling height of the first floor by a foot, and a little bit of detailing underneath the, the gable ends, but it, it was approved. Uh, downtown amendments that you heard I in... I think of that one. What's that? Which one was that? I'm just blanking. The single family, the large home. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. On I Windsor, 925 went Windsor. Yeah, Windsor. Yeah. I'm sorry. I yeah, heard I said, River. Oh, I think you said oh, River. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, 925 said. Windsor. Yeah, I went Windsor. to that hearing at the council. It was something else. You did. I'm becoming yes. an old and bitter planning commissioner <laughs> when you show up at council. <laughs> Hoo-wee, though. The NIMBY's got him. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So the, the downtown amendments that you heard in September, those were approved um, by council on October 24th. They, they actually added some language uh, requiring um, uh, that projects, non-residential projects, a commercial project contribute $5 per square foot uh, above the base height. And that's both in additional height A and B. And that would go into the Affordable Housing Trust Fund. Um, and that was, that was Council Member Newsom who, uh, yes, he's so quiet, and then he comes out with this great idea. I love it. <laughs> so we uh, we submitted those amendments to the Coastal Commission, and we're optimistic they're going to hear it at their December meeting, which is the 13th to the 15th. It's actually here in Santa Cruz at the Dream Inn, nice. so we're we're hoping it makes that agenda. Um, and then uh, the senior housing facility at 126 Eucalyptus that you heard about a year ago. Um, it was appealed to council by both the applicant yep, and a neighbor. Yes. <laughs> they approved it. It was appealed to the Coastal Commission, who found no substantial issue, and then was litigated. Um, we just found out today that we prevailed, the city prevailed in court, and the um, petitioner waived her right of appeal. So um, now the applicants are free to go ahead and 
um, pursue building permits. Can I ask what the applicant appealed? Yeah, this is interesting. Was it a condition? It was, yes. Yeah. It was a condition related to the affordable housing requirement. I see. And yeah. how, how did that go? Um, that that was upheld. And that then component? The, and then the neighbor's appeal, okay. appeal was denied. I see. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> there was a debate on which units were subject to our inclusionary requirement. Yeah, so what, what did it end Unclear. up being? What, if there's a kitchen or something like that? Yeah, I remember yeah, right. appliances. The self-contained units was what staff would recommend we base it on based on definitions contained in the code. And, and I think there was 13 of those, so it was 20% uh, of that, whatever the math comes out to, and, and the council upheld that. So, um, and then... Eric, before we leave that, after all that, I met with neighbors and, like, the developer will pay for a killer traffic calming device right there if they want to do something cool that's not just a speed bump, you know. So I um, just want to put that in your head and okay. I'll email. I think Clara was on that project, but yes. I'll email you guys. This is like totally extracurricular, but I'm yeah, like, no, hey, great. if we're going to put bulb outs, it might as well like get some monarch butterfly or something on there. And the neighbors were psyched on it too. So yep. maybe we can make that happen when it gets to plan. Make sure you copy me. She's on maternity leave right oh, now. Oh, that's so, right. Wow. Um, okay. yeah. it's, it's the second time. It's Remember? a baby boomer wow. up here. Wow. Awesome. <laughs> the years go by. <laughs> uh, but public works probably will not do that on their own. So if yeah, you don't we'll mind following need up, need input from fire it. as well. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Nothing crazy, but, you know, just something more than a... Yeah. Uh, upcoming schedule, next meeting on the 16th, you have the housing element. Um, and then we... Um, Rescheduled the regular meeting of December 7th because of a conflict with Hanukkah and a city council policy um, to November 30th. And at that meeting, you're going to hear an appeal of a zoning administrator approval of a 40 unit housing project at 900 High Street. And, uh, and then we, it looks like we do have items for the second meeting in December, which is the 21st. So, um, wow. FYI. Keeping you busy here at the very end. <laughs> Well, uh, let everyone know if people have, you know, plans are going to be gone those dates. I think I'll yep. be around, but yeah. quorum gets close. Some of these. The Thursday before Christmas. So Christmas is so weird this year. That's all I have. Thank you for... December I just twenty first is a terrible idea. If we can possibly, yeah, I, think, like, I think it's really <laughs> FYI, you know, yeah, like not a lot of people. Nobody's gonna be fully on it at that point. No, I think. maybe we can just do it. Yeah, it's yeah, up yeah. To you. I, I, if I'm it's like critical, it has to go. It's, yeah, don't think I'll be able to make it. It's finals day for me, man. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I'm just saying. We've we what we have is um, a use permit for a fitness facility in Harvey West. There's a. Hazard mitigation update by Tiffany, and then potentially the hotel, uh, the downtown hotel will be on that agenda, um, depending on um, how the Coastal Commission scheduling goes of the amendment. We might have a new council in January, too, huh? Mm -hmm. Can I, it, Eric, I just wanted to say, Never mind. with this master plan process going on for so many years on the wharf, I, I really appreciate you guys just being able to stick to it and execute all the things that you've accomplished it's it's thankless and i appreciate your effort yeah thank you i'll, I'll um, give all the credit to economic development they've been really shouldering I, most of the load <laughs> on that i talked to dave today earlier to just to get some questions answered and he was fantastic great appreciate it yeah thank you next year right? oh, that's right that's 23. i'm thinking of a different thing here. yeah march they do no, oh, never mind. It doesn't matter. <laughs> I was thinking of having a happy Christmas, but things are going to need to go. So that's just how well, it is. Well, that meeting on the 21st is Christmas Day for the day. All right. So uh, with that, if we don't have any other updates, we don't have any subcommittees, I will now adjourn this meeting. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.